Hello everyone and uh, we are continuing with our NEET practice sessions now. Uh, so last time we had a look at a few questions. Let us move ahead and take a look at more questions. Okay. Now the questions that we'll be taking a look at today are a bit more conceptual questions where we will require to analyze the situation and the application of concepts. So let us take a look at the questions one by one. Okay, so the first question that we are discussing is also from last year's NEET paper itself. Which of the following would help in prevention of diuresis? Now, what is diuresis? Recall that diuresis is the process of urine formation, right? So, substances like tea, coffee, etc. are known as diuretics because they cause urination, because they result in high amount of urine formation. So, if this asks about prevention of diuresis, that means this is supposed to occur during a condition where the body is suffering from what? It's suffering from lower water concentration, right? So, in this case, what mechanism is actually switched on when the body, when the body feels low on water? The osmoreceptors or the water receptors in the body they trigger a mechanism which is called as renin angiotensin mechanism yes can you recall yeah it's a renin angiotensin mechanism now when we talk about renin angiotensin mechanism we have first and foremost thing we have adh okay adh anti-diuretic hormone do we have adh over here anywhere yes our option c talks about adh so more water reabsorption due to under secretion of adh is what it says now, if the water concentration is going down and ADH's function is to bring about reabsorption of water from the distal convoluted tubule, would its under secretion be of any help? Yeah. Would its under secretion of ADH be of any help? No. So, it is not going to prevent diuresis. Okay. So, ADH option which we have over here, the option number C is out of out of our scope atrial natriuretic factor causes vasoconstriction now let us understand what is atrial natriuretic uretic fact atrial natriuretic factor in the renin angiotensin mechanism due to renin converting angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 and further to angiotensin 2 the blood pressure is increased why because angiotensinogen or uh, angiotensin 2 is a powerful vasoconstrictor isn't it so as vasoconstriction takes place, what will happen? The blood pressure will increase and blood pressure will also be increased because of activity of ADH. Remember ADH is getting secreted because of uh, less water concentration in the body. So the body wants to reabsorb more water. So ADH is also a vasoconstrictor. Its other name is vasopressin, right? So angiotensin 2 is a vasoconstrictor. ADH is a vasoconstrictor, right? Both of them are increasing the blood pressure. So, who is going to get affected? The heart. So, when the heart receives too much blood flow, heavy pressure, heavy blood pressure, the heart is going to release the atrial natriuretic factor, ANF, right? Now, this atrial natriuretic factor is going to do what? It is going to reduce the blood pressure. How does it how does ANF reduce the blood pressure? It reduces blood pressure by vasodilation. Isn't it? So what does my option say over here? Atrial natriuretic factor causes vasoconstriction. So is that a correct option? It's not because atrial natriuretic factor is causing what? Vasodilation. So this is gone. This, this is gone, gone right? right? Decrease in secretion of renin by JG cells. What are JG cells? Which apparatus are we talking about? Yeah, juxtaglomerular apparatus, right? JG cells, renin is being secreted by the juxtaglomerular cells, right? So if renin is responsible for renin angiotensin mechanism, decrease in secretion, is it, is it going to be of any help? It's, it's not, not going to be of any help again. again. Okay. So, so what are we left with? We use the elimination method over here. 
but, but let, let us actually confirm the answer reabsorption of sodium and water from the renal tubules due to aldosterone aldosterone is secreted from where from the adrenal cortex okay aldosterone is reabsorbing a lot of sodium so the hypertonicity of the blood increases because more solute is present now to uh, balance that wouldn't there be excessive reabsorption of water right guys yeah there would be excessive reabsorption of water so if there is excessive reabsorption of water what will it lead to it will lead to prevention of diuresis are you following that yes so because of this diuresis will be prevented and ultimately what will happen is the person will urinate less so the correct answer over here is d reabsorption of sodium and water from renal tubules due to aldosterone any doubts in this no sir sure let's take a look at the next question in light reaction plastoquinone facilitates the transfer of electrons from this is light reaction transport of electrons so what are we talking about we are talking about photophosphorylation isn't it so there are two photophosphorylations cyclic photophosphorylation and non cyclic photophosphorylation what are the components of uh, cyclic photophosphorylation ps1 right then we have ferredoxin reducing substance ferredoxin then what do we have we have cytochrome b6 cytochrome f then what do we have we have plastocyanin which ultimately returns the electrons to ps1 do we have plastoquinone anywhere over here we don't so what are we talking about when we are talking about a light reaction over here we are talking about non cyclic photophosphorylation let us take a look at the scheme of non cyclic photophosphorylation for revision purposes so ps1 right ps1 basically releases four electrons which are taken up by whom which are taken up by frs right from frs they go to ferredoxin from ferredoxin reducing substance they go to ferredoxin from ferredoxin they go to nadp plus yeah nadp plus now nadp plus becomes nadp2 minus right this is what is happening over here do you see plastoquinone anywhere in this reaction no isn't it so my option a is not applicable ps1 to atp synthase is it do, do we again have atp synthase anywhere over here in this reaction no right now cytochrome b6 complex to ps1 let us take a look at it well, let, let us let us study the c and d options now here what happens is recall that ps photosystems core center is what chlorophyll a chlorophyll a cannot stay in its ionized form that means what it has lost the electrons right and it has got ionized it cannot stay in its ionized form for more than 10 raised to minus 9 seconds right now if it is unable to stay in the ionized form for for more than such a short span of time shouldn't the electrons be back to ps1 but what is happening over here the electrons have been sent to nicotinamide adenine a uh, dinucleotide phosphate right i hope you recall the full form of nadp yep So nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate is the one which is receiving the electrons. So are the electrons going to come back to PS1? No. So who comes to PS1 rescue? PS2. So PS2 when it gets bombarded by light, it releases four electrons. Right? Which are taken up by coenzyme quinone or ubiquinone. right from ubiquinone they go to plastoquinone 
फ्रॉम प्लास्टोक्विनोन साइटोक्रोम बी सिक्स साइटोक्रोम एफ फ्रॉम साइटोक्रोम एफ टू प्लास्टोसाइन एंड फ्रॉम प्लास्टोसाइन बैक टू पी एस वन आर यू फॉलोइंग दैट रिमेंबर दैट पी एस वन कैन रिसीव इलेक्ट्रॉन्स इन रिटर्न फॉर्म फ्रॉम प्लास्टोसाइन एन ओनली ओके सो वेर एम आई सींग प्लास्टोक्विनोन आई एम सींग प्लास्टोक्विनोन ओवर यर राइट सो माई करेक्ट आंसर इज पी एस टू टू साइटोक्रोम बी सिक्स एफ कॉम्प्लेक्स अंडरस्टर दिस नाउ जस्ट टू कंप्लीट द साइकिल पी एस टू इज ऑल्सो एट अ लॉस ऑफ फोर इलेक्ट्रॉन्स इज इट सिंस इट इज एट अ लॉस ऑफ फोर इलेक्ट्रॉन्स हु इज गोइंग टू रिप्लेनिश द इलेक्ट्रॉन्स फोटो लिस ऑफ वॉटर सो बिकॉज ऑफ फोटो लिस ऑफ वॉटर because of photolysis of water what will happen four electrons will be given back to ps2 correct so this is how the reaction will proceed and it will be completed yeah any doubts with this question no great okay if you have any doubts just put them in the comments i'll take the doubts yep so um Let's move ahead with the next question. Match the following: zygotene, pachytene, diplotene, dikinase, terminalization, chiasma, the crossing over synapses. So what are we actually dealing with over here? Is meiosis one, right? So meiosis one. What are the what are the stages in meiosis one? We have zygotene, leptotene, pachytene, and dikinases right sorry yes now leptos means a thread zygos means pairing patchy is where crossing over is occurring okay diplotene is a process where we see certain changes and dikinases is a separation so so when we talk about pachytene pachytene is where we see the synaptonemal complex forming and crossing over occurring now because of the synaptonemal complex formation what happens over here is the chromosomes come together and they form a bivalent structure and then they undergo crossing over remember recombination recombination is carried out by the enzyme recombinase please do not forget this the enzyme's name is recombinase which carries out genetic recombination now once genetic recombination is over it has been completed the chrome the synaptonemal complex dissolves as the synaptonemal complex dissolves what happens over here is the chromosomes will repel each other as the chromosomes repel each other the point of attachment of chromosomes which is called as what chiasmata isn't it this this point of attachment which is called as chiasmata becomes much more visible yep and the chromosomes simply repel each other then in dikinases there is a process which is called as terminalization yeah so what happens in terminalization in terminalization the chromosomes repel each other further and the chiasmata moves to the termina that is the telomere of the chromosomes yeah that is the reason it is called as what terminalization okay so let us take that into account and understand this uh, let, let us come to the answer so the correct answer over here is d yep so zygotene is where we see uh, synapses formation pachytene is where crossing over is occurring diplotene is where we just discussed uh, 
your chiasmata is seen and diakinase is where terminalization is occurred. So that's the correct answer, right? Any doubt? Anything with meiosis that you want me to uh, discuss more? Next, match the column question. This is this is majorly from Human Health and Diseases chapter. Eosinophils, basophils, neutrophils, lymphocytes. Now, what are these? These are WBCs, right? Out of these, out of all these WBCs, the first three are what? They are granulocytes, right? And then we have lymphocytes. And all these cells are responsible for some action in the immune system, right? So let us take a look at how they work as defense mechanisms. Eosinophils, basophils, neutrophils, lymphocytes. Now, lymphocytes are responsible for what? Lymphocytes are responsible for cell-mediated immune response, right? They are the ones that are responsible for production of antibodies. Neutrophils are first responder phagocytes, right? With monocytes, neutrophils bring about phagocytosis, right? So these are these are what these are the cells of the immune system where they are part of the general defense mechanism. So neutrophils and monocytes. So lymphocytes are responsible for what immune response. Neutrophils are phagocytes. Now basophils and eosinophils is what we need to take a look at. Basophils are the ones that are granulocytes which contain Histamine. Okay. Histamines are released by whom? Basophils. Whereas eosinophils get activated in hypersensitivity reactions. Okay. And they release certain substances which are called as histaminases. What do histaminases, histaminases do? Histaminases, they destroy histamine and prevent the hypersensitivity reaction. You know, people, people can actually have an anaphylactic shock. Yep. And then they can die. Right, they, they, they basically can die because of the anaphylactic shock, the allergic response. So this is the so to prevent that from happening, your eosinophils release histaminases, and these histaminases will save you. So the answer over here comes what? Answer becomes C. Yeah. So eosinophils release of histaminases, which are destructive enzymes. Basophils, release of granules containing histamines, neutrophils, phagocytosis, and lymphocytes are for immune response, specifically cell-mediated immune response. Let's take a look at the next question. The infectious stage of plasmodium that enters the human body is plasmodium. What does it cause? It causes a disease called malaria. Plasmodium has two hosts, a mosquito and a human. Yep. In the mosquito and the human, plasmodium undergoes reproduction. It utilizes both modes of reproduction, sexual mode of reproduction also and asexual mode of reproduction also. So inside the mosquito, it undergoes sexual reproduction, whereas in the human, it undergoes asexual reproduction. Right? It undergoes what? It undergoes asexual reproduction. So when we look at the life cycle of plasmodium, when we look at the life cycle of the plasmodium parasite, which causes malaria, it enters the humans in the sporozoid stage. So the answer over here is sporozoid. Okay. So it enters the humans in the sporozoid stage. Then it migrates to the liver. From the liver, it migrates to the proliferating RBCs where it multiplies. Okay, and then what does it form? It forms cells which are called as gametocytes. And these gametocytes will give you the male gametocyte and the female gametocyte. Now at this moment, if the mosquito bites this human, 
uh, on any mosquito, you know, I mean, uh, anophilus only, but it's not a necessity that it may or may not have malarial parasite in it again. So if it is just, if it is, if it is not a carrier of malarial parasite and if it bites this human at this particular moment, it will become a carrier of malarial parasite. Yeah, the female anophilus mosquito. Now what will happen? These gametocytes will enter the mosquito. There, they will go where? There they will go into the gut of the mosquito where they will undergo sexual reproduction. So the gametocytes will fuse and they will form structures which are called as sporozoids. These sporozoids will now migrate to the salivary gland of the female Anopheles mosquito. And from the salivary gland, when this mosquito bites some another human again, they will be transferred to the human. So two stages, two hosts, one host which is mosquito and the other host which is human. So plasmodium requires two hosts to complete its life cycle. Yep, asexual reproduction in the human, sexual reproduction in the mosquito. Got it? Yep. So let's move ahead and take a look at the next question. The process of growth is maximum during senescence, dormancy, log phase, lag phase. Now to understand this, we need to take a look at the growth curve. Okay, so if I draw a simple growth curve graph over here, yeah. The growth curve majorly shows us four phases. The lag phase, the log phase, the stationary phase and then the death phase. Yep. So lag, log, which is also called as exponential phase, stationary and death phase okay now whichever organism you take whenever you provide resources to an organism the organism first analyzes the resources and during as during the time as such when it is analyzing the resources there is no growth the organism isn't multiplying the cells are not multiplying okay and that stage is known as what the lag phase Organisms start multiplying once they learn how to use the resources. So once they know how to use the carbon sources, the resources, etc., the multiplication begins. And this is exponential. Okay, the multiplication is exponential. So it's a log phase. So the actual growth is occurring where? In this region. Stationary phase is the time when the resources are reducing you know so there aren't many resources available for the organism to keep on multiplying that is the reason it now enters the stationary phase and as the resources start dwindling detrimentally death sets in so this is what is known as a growth curve so the process of growth is maximum during when log phase that is the exponential phase any doubts with this no. great nice next question flippers of penguins and dolphins are examples of industrial melanism natural selection adaptive radiation and conversion evolution industrial melanism is a straight up very simple example which is of the moth called Biston bitularia. Yeah. Biston bitularia was a moth whose population studies were carried out in the pre industrialization period and the post industrialization period. Okay. So, industrial melanism is not applicable. Natural selection, not applicable over here either. What are we talking about here is convergent evolution. 
what is convergent evolution and there are two types of evolution convergent evolution and divergent evolution see understand the terms it's very simple diverge means to move away converge is to come to something right so so when so when we say things are moving away in terms of evolution where are they moving away from they are moving away from their origin okay so if i say this is the source and origin and if i am denoting functions with a circle then what is happening over here you have a common ancestor from where the organisms are evolving to perform different functions so what is happening over here divergence is happening isn't it so this is called as divergent evolution let's talk about what is convergent evolution so let's say i have different origins i mean organisms of different origins okay and all of these organisms are being subjected to the same function that is they are supposed to carry out the same function what is going to happen these organisms are going to diverge from the ancestral origin and evolve certain structures which will help them exist or survive in the conditions that they are subjected to so they are diverging from their origin but converging to perform the same function right so if i am talking about flippers of penguins penguins are birds aren't they but they have flippers the uh, the four limbs are modified into flippers why to help them in swimming dolphins dolphins are mammals aren't they so the four limbs are modified again into what flippers so both have aquatic habitat both require swimming for their existence so they have come from different origin okay different ancestral origin but are showing structures for the common function and this is what is convergent evolution right so flippers of penguins and dolphins will show nothing but convergent evolution right let's take a corollary example over just to complete this topic if i say um uh, four limbs of humans and four limbs of bats yeah what will they show they will be showing divergent evolution why because bat is a flying mammal so the four limbs of the bat have been modified to aid its function of flying got it let's take the next question identify the wrong statement with reference to the gene i that controls abo blood groups gene i has how many alleles i a which gives you blood group a i b which gives you blood group b and small i which is the recessive condition okay which will give you no uh, which will basically give you o blood group if it is in a uh, homozygous recessive condition now the question over here in the options one word that you come across is sugar yeah now what why is it called as a sugar i a and i b are responsible for giving us certain things which are called as particulate antigens okay particulate antigens which are present on the surface of the rbcs and these particulate antigens are glycoproteins yep recall biomolecules glycoproteins isn't it so protein the parent body is a protein and it has carbohydrate or sugar moieties attached to it so when we look at the cell membrane of the rbcs if this is the cell membrane of the rbcs the protein part is embedded in the membrane and the sugar part is projected outwards like this and this entire thing is the particulate antigen the antigen a or antigen b 
Are you following this? Simple enough? Yeah. So your genes are going to give rise to these things. That is the reason they say sugar over here. So when I, A, I, B are present together, they express the same type of sugar. Is that the case? Allele small i does not produce any sugar. The gene i has three alleles. A person will have only two of these three alleles. What do we have to find out over here? We have to find out the wrong statement. So let's try elimination. A person will have only two of the three alleles. Is that correct? That is correct, isn't it? Why? Because we are deployed organisms. No? As an individual, we are going to have two alleles. So this is correct. Gene I has three alleles. Is that correct? Yeah. It is. Allele small i does not produce any sugar. It doesn't, no? that's the reason, um, what do you call this? I mean, O blood group does not have any antigen on it. When I, A and I, B are present together, they express the same type of sugar. If they would have expressed the same type of sugar, would they have been different antigens? No. So the correct answer, the wrong statement, but the correct answer is A. Got it? Just to complete the um, discussion with blood groups, remember blood groups, are ABO blood group is a very good example of two non-Mendelian phenomena. Multiple allelism and what's the second one? Oh, no. Yes, very good. Yep, multiple allelism and codominance. Yep, multiple allelism. Why? Because we have multiple alleles con uh, controlling the same phenotype. Codominance is when we see blood group AB. So two dominant alleles giving you one phenotype. Yeah. Which of the following hormone levels will cause release of ovum? from the graphene follicle. What are the hormones? We are talking about ovulation. So we are talking about the menstrual cycle. What hormones are responsible or what hormones drive the menstrual cycle? Luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, estrogen and progesterone. Right? These four, yep. And if I if I talk about the hypothalamic hormone, uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone (GnRH), right? These are the hormones that basically drive the menstrual cycle. So when we talk about this, LH, luteinizing hormone, luteinizing hormone is responsible for what? Luteinizing hormone is responsible for the rupturing of the graphene follicle and the release of the ovum. So it is responsible for ovulation. And it is also responsible for converting the remnant graphene follicle into corpus luteum, which will secrete progesterone. Right? Okay. Now, so low concentration of LH, is it going to be of any use in ovulation? No, absolutely not. Low concentration of FSH, is it going to be of any use in ovulation? Definitely not. Why? Because FSH plays a role during follicular phase. Recall menstrual cycle. Four phases. Menstrual phase. Follicular phase. Ovulatory phase. And luteal phase. Right? Follicular, uh, menstrual, follicular, ovulatory and luteal phase. Correct? Four phases. FSH is active during follicular phase where because of the activity of FSH on the developing follicles estrogen is released okay and estrogen br uh, brings about a thickening of the endometrium got it so FSH is not involved in ovulation it's not directly involved in ovulation high concentration of estrogen high concentration of progesterone let us come to the answer right now the further discussions will uh, uh, bring us to the answer directly. Progesterone. 
Progesterone provides negative feedback to LH and to FSH. That means when progesterone is present in the blood, anterior pituitary will not be secreting luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Yep. But luteinizing hormone surge is a prerequisite for ovulation. So high concentration of progesterone is also the wrong answer. But high concentration of estrogen, does it make direct sense? Does it? It actually doesn't. Okay. But what does it do? Let us understand that. In the follicular stage, the ovulatory phase follows the follicular stage. In the follicular stage of the menstrual cycle, when the estrogen, uh, estrogen peaks, this estrogen peaking puts positive feedback for LH on the anterior pituitary. So because of estrogen surge, LH surge takes place from the anterior pituitary on the 14th day. And because of the LH surge, graphene follicle ruptures and ovulation takes place. So the correct answer over here is high concentration of estrogen. Got it? Okay. Yes. Uh, if, uh, if there was an option, high concentration of LH, then that would be correct. Yeah? Or all the same. See, if there is high concentration of LH, see, if there is high concentration of LH, that would be a very direct answer, Divyansh. Yeah. So, but yet there will be ambiguity between high concentration of estrogen, etc. So, the more correct answer would be high concentration of LH, surge of LH. Okay. But generally, such, ambigu such ambiguity is avoided when it comes to uh, options. Yeah. Sure. Shall we move ahead to the next question? Name the enzyme that facilitates the opening of DNA helix during transcription. Who is the sole enzyme of transcription? One type of RNA polymerase in prokaryotes. RNA polymerase 1, 2, 3 in eukaryotes. Out of which RNA Pol2 is responsible for transcription of mRNA. So everything is done by... Right? Yes? Great. The process responsible for facilitating loss of water in liquid from, from the tip of grass blades at night and in early morning is what? These are these are pretty direct questions. Is root pressure? Why is it root pressure? Because there is no transpiration occurring during the night, and the water is being continuously absorbed. So there is a high amount of root pressure. There is there is very really high root pressure, and this because of this high root pressure, water water droplets come out from the leaf margins from structures which are called as hydathodes. Are you following that? From structures which are called as what? Hydathodes. And these structures are the ones that are responsible for um, water uh, removal, which is the process is known as guttation. Simple enough? Nice. Now look at this question, okay? Understand this. You know this. So, so nothing to worry or nothing to panic because of all the mathematics that you see on your screen. So if the distance between two consecutive base pairs is 0 0.34 nanometers and the total number of base pairs of a DNA double helix in a typical mammalian cell is 6.6 .6 into 10 raised to, my, uh, 10 raised to 9 base pairs, then the length of the DNA is approximately what? What are these characteristics of which DNA? Mm. 
isn't it yeah all of these are characteristics of human dna obtained by the human genome project so ultimately the answer is 2.2 meters right Which of the following refer to the correct examples of organisms which have evolved due to changes of environment brought about by anthropogenic action? Anthropogenic means human action. So because of human action, anthropogenic, anthropogenic evolution is a type of evolution due to human intervention. For example, bacteria. Okay, bacteria, prokaryotes undergoing uh, or you know prokaryotes giving rise to uh, drug resistance, antibiotic resistance. Why has this happened? Because of the irresponsible usage of antibiotics by humans, isn't it? Uh, antibiotic resistance bacteria that we have. If antibiotics were not in usage by humans, on a rampant usage by humans, do you think prokaryotes would have developed antibiotic resistance? Maybe not, right? So whatever changes, whatever evolutionary changes have happened because of human intervention are known, it is basically known as what? Anthropogenic evolution. Got it? So please remember this term. Anthropogenic means human intervention. Darwin's finches of Galapagos Islands. Galapagos Islands were a highly undisturbed, uh, un undisturbed ecosystem when when Darwin when Darwin went and studied them, etc. And when Darwin went and studied them, at that moment itself, Darwin had seen a lot of fin uh, many finches. So the finches finches are birds, right? So these finches on the Galapagos Islands itself, they showed different types of beaks, depending on what depending on the food habit that they utilized right so galapagos islands were undisturbed for a very long time today also many research uh, many research expeditions are carried out to the galapagos islands otherwise they are kept undisturbed so darwin's finches has already shown evolution uh, nat by natural selection right so anthropogenic action did not apply to darwin's finches at all Herbicide resistant weeds. Do you think that is anthropogenic action? It is, isn't it? Nature does not go on spreading herbicides everywhere. We do. Because we do not want some plants, right? So, herbicide resistance. So, excessive use of herbicide is going to bring about resistance in the plants, the weeds that we, do, that we want to get rid of. Drug, re drug resistance in eukaryotes or prokaryotes, any cell, drug resistance. Who is making and utilizing the drugs for uh, treatment purposes? We are. Anthropogenic. Man created breeds of domesticated animals like dogs. Remember we studied uh, strategies for enhancement in food production, where we studied animal breeding also, isn't it? So for better production, for, for obtaining better products, etc. What are we doing? We are carrying out animal breeding. So ultimately, anthropogenic intervention. So what is my correct answer? Statements 2, 3 and 4 are the ones where anthropogenic action is applicable. Right? Shallow. Let's move ahead. Meiotic division of the secondary oocyte is completed when? After zygote formation, at the time of fusion of a sperm with an ovum, prior to ovulation, at the time of copulation. Yeah. So let us let us take a look at it. Let us understand oogenesis. Now, when we talk about oogenesis, guys, oogenesis begins in the embryonic stage itself okay as opposed to man uh, uh, in females the gametogenesis starts in the embryonic stage itself so 
in the embryonic stage there are there are a million you know few million cells present in each of the ovaries by the time the fetus is developed and the female is born these cells get arranged into clusters of cells which are called as follicles okay what follicles primordial follicles okay and when the fetus grows through childhood etc and reaches puberty in that time from birth to puberty during that time many of these follicles degenerate yeah so by the time the girl reaches the puberty a few thousand follicles are what are present in each of the ovary and when menstruation begins every month or every 28 days each of the ovaries take it in turns to release the egg now when the process had started yeah when the process had started the process had begun with the primordial cell which was a diploid cell so primordial cell which underwent mitosis okay to form oogonia okay these oogonia develop and they grow in size and they develop into what primary oocyte okay now all these are still diploid primary oocyte undergoes meiosis 1 okay and becomes the secondary oocyte okay and it is at this stage that the secondary oocyte is arrested at so the secondary oocyte is arrested in meiosis it has finished its meiosis one it has been arrested in meiotic stage okay and as the follicles and the primordial fo as the primordial follicle becomes primary follicle primary follicle to secondary follicle secondary follicle to graafian follicle yep as they develop the ovum grows okay but it still remains what a secondary oocyte which is no which is haploid and it is known as what the ovum okay now this secondary oocyte is what is released during ovulation are you following this so at ovulation the egg cell or the oocyte hasn't completed its meiosis right so when does it complete its meiosis when it gets fertilized by a sperm so because of fertilization certain changes develop certain changes take place in the oocyte the ovum and the oocyte finishes its meiosis giving rise to a polar body okay meiosis 1 also gives rise to a polar body okay after completion of meiosis 2 two, two more polar bodies are formed and what you get is a haploid ovum and fertilization uh, and then the zygote formation takes place so the sperm nucleus and the uh, haploid ovum nucleus now fuse and give you and give rise to the zygote so the correct answer is what Yep. At the time of fusion of a sperm with the ovum, got it? Great. Match the column. Inhibitor of catalytic activity possesses peptide bonds, cell wall material in fungi, secondary metabolite. Simple. Let's understand this. Let, let let me take the option which i am absolutely sure about peptide bonds what type of components have peptide bonds proteins isn't it which of which of these four options is a protein collagen collagen is a protein cell wall material in fungi chitin right inhibitor of catalytic activity or secondary metabolite let's understand that secondary metabolite ricin is a secondary metabolite okay which is 
See, ricin is a poisonous substance. When plants give rise to poisonous substances like li ricin, nicotine, etc., these are defense mechanisms. Defense mechanisms against what? Herbivorous plants. Got it? Yeah. So, my C should be three. That is, cell wall should be a uh, cell wall material in fungi should be chitin, right? So the only option that gives me is this. Are you following this? Do you understand what I did? Wonderful. Shallow. Transverse section of a plant shows following anatomical features. Anatomy of flowering plants. Large number of scattered vascular bundles surrounded by bundle sheaths. Large conspicuous parenchymatous ground tissue. Vascular bundles conjoint and closed. Vascular bundles conjoint and closed is a characteristic of a monocot plant. Isn't it? Why closed vascular bundles? Because they do not have cambium. If, it is ca if cambium is present in the vascular bundles, what is going to happen? it is going to result in formation of secondary tissue, isn't it? Secondary xylem, secondary phloem, etc. So since there is no cambium, the vascular bundles are closed. So since it says conjoint and closed, dicotyledonous options, the options that say dicotyledonous are just eliminated, right? So dicotyledonous, gone. Now the options are monocotyledonous stem and monocotyledonous root. Yeah, phloem parenchyma absent. The option what you need to take a look at over here is this, the statement. That is a defining statement which tells, which says scattered vascular bundles. Yeah, also large conspicuous parenchymatous ground tissue. Monocotyledonous stem does not show pith, pith which is the central part and then everything is arranged around it. Monocotyledonous stem does not show pith and the vascular bundles are scattered. Monocotyledonous root however shows uh, pith and uh, vascular bundles arranged in radii. Got it? So the answer is monocotyledonous stem. Yeah, anatomy in flowering plant, anatomy of flowering plants. The production, of, the products of reaction cataly catalyzed by nitrogenase in root nodules of leguminous plants are nitrogenase. When we talk about nitrogenase enzyme, nitrogenase enzyme is the enzyme that brings about a reduction of atmospheric nitrogen. Nitrogen is, what is the source? It says root nodules of leguminous plants, isn't it? So what do we have there? We have rhizobium. Root nodules of leguminous plants, we have rhizobium. So rhizobium contains nitrogenase. So nitrogen is, what does it actually do? It takes atmospheric nitrogen which is in this manner and with every step it goes on reducing it so you get NH NH NH2 and finally you get NH3 NH3 right is it yeah and when this is happening, you will get byproduct, which is hydrogen. Because hydrogen is also H2, no? So it will it will be broken down and added to nitrogen. Broken down and added to nitrogen. Got it, people? Simple enough? One thing that we need to understand is nitrogenase is sensitive to oxygen. Yeah? Oxygen can destroy nitrogenase. So the leguminous plant like fenugreek, pea plant, etc., they have a compound called as leg hemoglobin. 
and this leg hemoglobin acts as an oxygen scavenger and prevents the oxygen from reacting with nitrogenase in the rhizobium so that rhizobium can fix atmospheric nitrogen for the leguminous plant. Got it? Yeah, wonderful. And that's th those are the questions for today. That's it for today. Do you all have any doubts that we need to take a look at? Nothing? Great. So, uh, these are the questions that I had selected from last year's um, NEAT paper. Uh, I'll be selecting a few more questions from more previous uh, NEAT papers, which required a lot of discussion and understanding. And that's how we will take a few more sessions in NEAT practice. Okay. So, uh, I shall see you all next time. And uh, we'll continue with the discussions. Okay. Bye, guys. Have a nice day.